probably best if you could do that on yours. Perfect. Yeah, I it have just, it going. Uh, it said, no, oh, there's a little red button that says recording. Oh, there you go. All right. Turn it. All right. So now <laughs> I have the live stream set up, and this should work for each one. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Are you guys ready to go live? Let's do it. Yeah. Let's do it. <laughs> Are you gonna give us a countdown? I will. <laughs> cool. <laughs> I've yes, never please. done. I've never gone live. This is. I'm not hip enough. I'm gonna do. I'm gonna do. <laughs> I'm gonna do the five, four, three, two, point. That's what I'm gonna do. Okay. Somehow I don't believe that you're not hip enough. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take that as like the highest compliment and hold it forever. <laughs> and I still won't go live. <laughs> uh. All right, five, four, three, two, we're live. Now I'm switching the view on the live stream. All right, it's saying we're telling your, your followers that you're alive. So now, great, people are joining. Hello, Yay! everybody. Hello, hello. <laughs> so I'm going to give this a few minutes to, to allow all the followers to trickle in and join our live stream. But uh, yeah, why don't everyone go around and introduce yourself? while we're waiting for people to join. How about we start with Catherine, go down. Hi, I'm Catherine. What else should we say? Uh, uh, I'm an actor in Philly. I'm a teaching artist with PYP, and I love reading new plays. Yay, all right, <laughs> Ange. Hi everyone, my name is Ange Bay. My pronouns are they, them, theirs. Um, I'm a proud PYP alum, and I'm also a performer, storyteller here in Philadelphia. Um, recently, I was in Candles with PYP, so if any of you, if any of you saw that, I had way different hair, but uh, I was in the show as Amara Jones. I'm very excited to read your place today. All right, great. Eric? Hi, everyone. I'm Eric. I'm also an actor here in the Philadelphia area. Been with PYP for about a year now. And I'm excited to read your plays. And Brittany. Hi, everyone. My name is Brittany. I use she, her pronouns. Um, I am the Associate Director of Education at PYP, so I do a lot of administrative work. Um, I'm also an educator. I do some performing and writing. Awesome. And my name is Brendan Dahl. I ran this competition. I am a high school student in Philadelphia. I'm a resident playwright at PYP. Um, and I was bored during the quarantine and wanted to get some people out there writing. I'm really, really thrilled with uh, the response to this competition. Um, all of your guys' submissions were amazing, um, mm -hmm. and I really hope that this will inspire people to keep writing, keep being creative throughout the entire quarantine, because that, at least for me, is one of the main things keeping me sane uh, while I'm mauled up inside. Great. All right, so um, while we are waiting here, uh, we have... Yeah, I think we can get started with our first play. Cool. All right, so we are very, very excited to uh, announce our first play, which is this one. Uh, this is The Odd Race by Kaya Prunty. Apologies if I'm not pronouncing the name correctly, but I believe it is Kaya Prunty. Uh, she is in fifth grade, um, and this play was typed by her mom from the original hand-printed document. Um, and if you look here on the right, pointing with my finger, we have uh, everyone's character names in the bottom left of their screen. So you can follow along with the play here as I go down, and you can see all our lovely actors bring it to life. So without for further ado, The Odd Race. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the race of the century. Let's meet the racers. Announcer walks to Tom. Hello, what's your name, and why do you want to win? My name is Tom, and I want to win because my family is here, and I, want, I don't want to let them down. Yay! <laughs> Announcer walks to Ted. My name is Ted. I don't want to win. I just want to beat Tom. Oh, <laughs> yeah! <laughs> Announcer moves on to Bree. Nice to meet you. What is your name? My name is Bree. I don't expect to win, but I hope I win. Woo, woo, woo. Sounds good. Announcer moves on to Violetta. 
Hi. Wow. <laughs> you look a lot younger than everyone else. So what is your name and age? My name is Violetta. I'm seven years old and I will win. <laughs> well, I can't wait to see. Uh, now let's get to the race. Ready, set, go! Wait! Bree and Violetta all start running. Wait, wait, wait! It's only 2.35. Clock strike 2.36. Okay, go! Tom, Ted, Bree, and Violetta run. Claire, in the crowd, opens her water bottle. There is a loud boom. My water bottle! Ah! I'm all wet. I think my water bottle exploded. Looks like the race ends here for you, Tom. Tom exits into the crowd looking unhappy. Okay, now that Tom is gone, Ted is in the lead. Wow, <laughs> he's going really fast. He's almost flying. Ted goes faster but trips over a rock. His shoes go flying off his feet. One hits Bree in the arm. Ouch! What are your shoes made of, rocks? Bree picks up the shoe and looks at it. Hey, <gasps> these shoes have wheels. That's not allowed. What's that? Is someone cheating? Ted, you are disqualified. <laughs> Violetta sticks her tongue out at Ted. The finish line is in sight, but Bree is way ahead of Violetta. A snake slithers up to Bree. Ah! Don't be scared. I'm here to give you some advice. Okay. Some people worry too much about winning. Sometimes that is not their fault. Sometimes others look around them and think that way, so they have no choice. But thinking you must win is a bad way to think. If you don't win, you might get very angry or frustrated. You might consider yourself a failure. Some people don't care about winning. They just want to have fun. They are not sore winners or losers. It is better to be that way. That's true. Unfortunately, you are not one of those people. So you cannot win this race. Snake bites Bree's ankle and then slithers. Ow! Bree screams and falls and gets up again. I'm okay. I just can't run anymore. Bree limps into the crowd. <laughs> well, looks like only Violetta's left. Unless something stops her, she will win. Violetta skips and then hopscotches her way across the finish line. There is a man behind the finish line. He is wearing a mask. You won race! I know! Do I get anything? You won race! Yes, I did! Do I get anything? Race you won? Do I... Oh, never mind. Violetta joins her parents in the crowd, and the crowd cheers. The... <laughs> <laughs> this is awesome. We love the way that this play incorporated all the different ingredients. It's really great. Mm -hmm. We love all the different characters. Uh, we all think that the snake monologue is just about truth uh, and really, really connected to that. So bravo to Kaya Printy in fifth grade. Please keep writing. You are so talented. This play was all right. Thank you for all the hearts, everybody. All right, so now we're going to move on. Yeah. <laughs> People are giving us hearts in the live stream. Yay! <laughs> hearts back to you. All right, so now for our first middle school winner, we have Take Me Home by Lydia Hessel Robinson, who's in eighth grade. And so what I want to do for this, as our actors change the name of their uh, little screens here, is I think I want each person to go down the line and read their character uh, description for the actors. Cool. So starting with Ivan. A scarlet macaw who is very interested in the legendary human world that his mother told him about. He is fluent in Paratese, but only knows three words in English. Ivan loves his mother very much and is concerned about her health as she ages. Daisy Periwinkle. A slightly disorganized human scientist who is very interested in the secret parrot world that she's learned about from her father. She's in her mid-30s, 
and wears capri length olive green cargo pants, large glasses with round frames, and an unzipped <laughs> blue windbreaker with some kind of shirt. She has made several failed attempts to learn parities, but she is fluent in English as she comes from a small, oh, London suburb. Oh, we have an accent, I just discovered. She is convinced that her father will be proud of her if she finds the parrot world and brings him back specimens. Fred Periwinkle, Daisy's elderly father in his 80s. He is rather befuddled and forgets to put the jam back in the fridge every time. But he used to be an esteemed scientist and claims he knew parities. He wears two short khaki pants that show his gray knitted socks, plaid shirts, uses a cane, and wears small round glasses with thin wire frames. He really wants his daughter to be safe, so he never told her about the portals to the parrot world. Madre. Ivan's mother, a scarlet macaw as well. She is the village doctor and is revered as a wise parrot. Madre wears a purple scarf around her head. She had a real name at some point in time, but everyone calls her Madre out of respect for the elderly bird. She has asthma. And then we have the young version of Daisy and the young version of Ivan, which are gonna be played by the same actors in our case. All right, act one, scene one. Curtains open to a beautiful jungle, which can be projected on a screen at the back of the stage. There can be the sounds of different parrots in the background. Ivan and Madre are sitting under a tree near the front of the stage, mashing up berries with their beaks. This is the parrot world. Madre, what exactly are these berries for? I can never remember all of your concoctions. Oh, they're just some antifungal fruits. They work especially well to treat aspergillus, which several birds have come down with recently. <laughs> I remember when I got aspergillus. It was terrible, and you fed me some gross worms to treat it. I wish you had these back then, because they taste so much better than the worms do. <laughs> That's why I use the berries now. A friend from another village told me. Madre is cut off by an explosion from offstage. Both she and Ivan quickly stand up to go investigate, but Ivan stops his mother from rushing off toward it by holding out a wing in front of her. Madre, it might not be safe. You're not as agile as you used to be, and the Parities people need you. I'll go see what it is. But Ivan, there might be injured birds over there that need immediate attention. I have to help them. I'm going, when there's an explosion, there's smoke. With your asthma, you'd be the one needing help. I'm going to bring back any parrots that are over there, okay? <sighs> Fine, but be careful, Ivan. Ivan gives Madre a kiss slash peck on the cheek before flying, using a fly system, off stage left. Madre shakes her head and sits back down, occasionally casting a worried glance in the direction Ivan left. Curtains close. Act 1, Scene 2. Curtains open to a split stage. Stage left is a sunny mid-afternoon day in a suburb of London. There is a Victorian-style house with a pretty garden. A sundial is in the garden, next to the steps leading to the front door which faces the audience. Daisy rushes out of the door carrying a cross-body satchel with a bulky mask zipped inside of it. She has a jumble of papers in one hand. She calls inside and dives for a paper she drops. Stage right is the same jungle background as in scene one, but there is a rocky outcropping on the left side. A large, about Ivan size, worn out brown leather boot is on the ground in front of the rocks, smoldering. There is smoke in the air around it. Fred is off stage for the entire scene. Dad, I'll be back soon. I just have to drop these off at my lab. Don't touch anything on the counter and make sure not to go near the new orange bird. He's very aggressive. Just call me if you need anything. Ivan flies in from stage right. He lands near the boot. Ivan tentatively reaches out with the claw to touch the boot, but retracts it immediately, hopping around. Yeah! Ouch. I don't like that thing. Yes, Daisy, dear. Can you pick up some jam while you're at the store? Ivan slowly circles the shoe, investigating it. Sorry, I just get through this. He flaps his wings around the boot to disperse the smoke. What is this? How did an explosion... Hmm. Dad, I'm not going to the store. There should be another jar of jam in the pantry. <laughs> Okay, thank you, Daisy. 
I thought there might be some jam in there. Have fun. I love you, Dad. Stay safe. And please put the jam in the fridge when you're done with it. And call me if you need anything. Oh, someday I'll come home and there will be jam all over the house. Poor Dad, he's losing it. I just need to find the parrot world before... Daisy trails off, noticing one last paper on the sundial. Daisy picks it up and checks the time. The shadows are at 2.36. How strange. I thought it was later than 2.36. I could have sworn that all the clocks inside were at 4.30. Shex watched and pulls a smartphone from her pocket. Ivan touches the heel of the boat with his claw again. He pulls on the boot, oh, boot until his head is in the foothold and looks around inside. Yep, 4.33. I doubt that both of my phone and watch are wrong, but how did the sundial? Daisy leans over the sundial, trips over the steps, and falls <gasps> into the sundial. At the same time, Ivan lets go of the boot and it falls over his head. <gasps> Daisy shrieks. <gasps> Ivan lets out a distressed walk. Daisy has disappeared. There is some sort of trap door that opens when pushed down on. Daisy dropped her papers on the ground again, and they flutter around the stage. Some of Ivan's feathers flutter to the ground around the boot at the same time. Curtains close. Act one, scene three. Curtains open to the same setting as in scene two. Daisy tumbles out of the boot, which has shrunk to the size of a normal boot to show scale. At the same time, Ivan falls out of the sundial and lies on his back, slightly stunned. The papers have scattered to the sides of the house, side of the stage. Several stuffed animal parrots that are near the boot flutter away by a fly system, and Daisy looks around at the surroundings in awe. What is this place? Am I unconscious? Did I get a concussion from the sundial? Oh dear, this is bad. A parrot tentatively tops for Daisy, who crouches down in awe, speaking softly. What the parrots? <gasps> Could it be the parrot world Dad has told me about? Was the sundial a portal? Fred's voice, sounding much younger and bright, booms over the stage. All other characters freeze. Daisy, sweetling, I'm trying to find the parrot world. I made a mask for you from feathers from all the parrots I've had. If you ever end up in the parrot world, make sure to wear it so the parrots know you need help getting home. Daddy, I love it. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Both Fred and young Daisy laugh as the voice is speaking. <laughs> all unfreeze. Daisy seems to remember something and unzips her satchel. She pulls out an ornate parrot mask with feathers of every parrot color imaginable. It has a gray beak. Daisy puts on the mask and begins walking around the jungle side of the stage, making parrot. I hope Dad was right. I hope they take me home. Where am I? What is this? How did I get here? What is this? Hello? I could have sworn I heard a scarlet macaw. Madre enters from stage right, cautiously. She sees Daisy poorly imitating a parrot and gasps. A real human? Was the explosion a portal? <gasps> a parrot came! Go away! Go away! Leave me alone! Go away! I don't like you! Go away! Human? Well, I'll be. If it isn't a scarlet macaw. I knew I heard you squawking. It's been years since I've last seen one of you. A human? I must be dreaming. Maybe that thing suffocated me and I'm about to die. Humans can't be real. Madre was just making up stories. Now stop making such a fuss. I'm not going to hurt you. My daughter just brought home a mighty fine looking orange bird. I just tried petting him, but he bit me. A feisty fellow. I bet you'll get along nicely. Daisy will be pleased when she sees you. I'll give you some jam to pass the time until she gets home. Fred closes the door, the front door hallway behind him, halfway behind him. Ivan lets out one last terrified cough. <coughs> Daisy approaches Madre, who runs away from <coughs> Curtains close. Act one, scene four. Curtains open to a dimly lit room. Fred is sitting on a blue velvet Victorian style couch, staring intently at Ivan who's in a cage. Ivan is pressed against the corner of the cage farthest from Fred. Across from the couch are two matching armchairs. 
a large wooden coffee table with an open jam, jam jar is between the couch and the chairs. There is one window at the back of the room, but the curtains are closed. Caw! Talk to me, Bertie, talk! I have no idea what you're saying. Please go away, I don't like humans. Ah, I got some squawkies from you. It's too bad the orange bird disappeared and went outside. He would have had you talking. And years ago, I might have understood you. Cacaw? Mm. What did Madre tell me? What am I supposed to say to humans? Something, something about home. Home! This is your new home, Squawky. Good job. Fred reaches out to pet Ivan. Ivan hisses and Fred retracts his hand. Oh no, you're not touching these feathers. So, he understood that weird word, and that made him want to touch me. But what was the rest? Ivan seems to remember something. Madre's voice, sounding younger, booms over the stage. Huh. Ivan, if you ever stumble through a portal to the human word world, remember these words. Take me home. <laughs> that sounds funny. <laughs> Take me home. <laughs> Ivan, remember that. The legend has it that a human who hears a parrot say those words will know to take the parrot to a portal. And And if that human shows up here wearing a parrot mask, we'll know. Well, we'll know to take it to one of our portals. But why can't they go back the way they came? Won't the same portal work over again? The portals only work on one day of the year and only in a specific time frame. So you must remember to say, take me home. Or you might be stuck in the human world until you can find a new portal by yourself. Fred and Ivan unfreeze. Ivan inches closer to Fred, who seems to have dozed off a bit. Take me home. Take me home! Take me home! I'll take me home! The paracode, he must have come from the sundial. And Daisy, I never told her. Today was the day that the sundial shoot portal activated. What if she fell in? The time frame's over, but there's also the fire hydrant has portal today. <laughs> We have to get you there in the next 15 minutes. Fred stands up and opens Ivan's cage. Ivan hesitantly hops out and shakes his wings. Fred beckons for Ivan to follow him. The two exit stage right. Ah, oh, he understood. Curtains close. Act one, scene five. The stage is split. On stage right is a street corner. The background is of a brick house with a large hedge in front of it, lining the sidewalk. There is a yellow fire hydrant on the corner of the sidewalk. A person is walking down the sidewalk towards the wing, pushing a stroller. Fred and Ivan walk on from stage right. Ivan is hopping and looking around at his surroundings in awe. On stage left is a jungle background, and there are several trees and tropical flowers around the stage. Some stuffed animal parrots can be, can be in the branches. There is a very large, upside-down, feathered pirate hat on the ground near the front of the stage. Madre flies in from stage left. Daisy runs after Madre, who lands near the hat. Daisy is still wearing the mask. Fred and Ivan stop by the fire hydrant. Person exits. Daisy's paper, papers were all over. She must have gone through the portal. 12 minutes left. Oh goodness, I hope Daisy makes it in time. There's not another portal opening for months. I should have told her about the portal so she'd be more careful. Uh, go home. 11 minutes left. Go home. Oh, she can talk. But why would I go home? How would I go home? I can do so much research here, and that shoe will be there when I'm finished. I need to finish Dad's research for him. I need to make him proud. If there's limited time, how much time do I have? Do how do I know that this is a portal? How can I trust this human? Fred takes out a screwdriver and begins to unscrew the fire hydrant's top. Ivan hops from foot to foot nervously. Madre squawks loudly. Ah, only 10 minutes, portal closes, go home, 
go home. What does she not understand? She has a mask. She should understand there can't be a humans here. Humans destroy. Ivan. Ivan went through the boot portal. He only has 10 minutes left to get back here. Brad finishes unscrewing the fire hydrant top and takes it off. Go on, little squawky. It was nice to meet you. Now get home. Ivan slowly approaches the fire hydrant. He looks down it, looks out to Fred. Fred nods encouragingly. Ivan makes a parrot noise in appreciation and gets ready to jump into the fire hydrant. Lights go out for a few seconds so Ivan can run to the other side of the stage. Lights go on. Ivan falls out of the hat. Fred smiles. <sighs> Daisy and Madre are both startled. They look over to see Ivan sit up. Oh, where did you come? <gasps> That's a portal. Ivan, you got through the portal. Madre, I almost didn't go. I was so worried that I'd end up stuck at the bottom of the yellow thing, but I'm home. I never should have touched that shoe. I never want to hear about the human world again. Ivan and Madre embrace. Fred <laughs> scratches his head and checks his watch. He looks anxious. 11 minutes, 10 minutes, that's a time limit. How come dad never told me? She was worried about the bird that came through the portal. Dad's probably worried about me. I have to get back to dad. Madre and Ivan let go of each other as Daisy walks towards them in the hat. Eight minutes. I know. Thank you for putting up with me. I'm just a foolish human who thought that the parrot world was the solution to everything. But dad's probably worried out of his mind. I won't bother you again, I promise. Daisy puts the hat on. Oops. Stage goes black. Curtains close. Act one, scene six. Curtains open. Fred is standing by the fire hydrant, nervous. The street and sidewalk now extend all the way to stage left, with different colored houses in the background. The hedge extends along the entire sidewalk. Daisy falls out of the fire hydrant, startling Fred. Daisy, you made it! Fred is cut off by Daisy throwing her arms around him. Fred hugs her back. Daisy begins to cry. Dad, now I know why you never told me about the portals. You were worried that I'd get stuck in the parrot world, and I would have stayed there if not for two parrots. I, want to, I wanted to be there to finish your research for you. I thought I would make you proud. I just wanted to make you proud. But then I realized that I couldn't leave you alone. I'll never make you worry about me again, I promise. I know, Daisy, I know. The parrot world was never meant for us, and our world was never meant for parrots. But you learned a good lesson, huh? How'd you do it? How did you know to come here? A scarlet macaw came through the sundial. He woke my brain up a little bit, and I brought him here. As we were leaving the house, I realized that you wouldn't forget your papers outside. <sighs> I probably would have. <laughs> and you would have come back. So I waited here. I'm glad you made it. So you're the reason I made it through the portal in time. You brought that parrot here. I saw him come through the hat on the other side and he had a, a really sweet moment with the parrot that took me to the portal. <laughs> then I knew I had to come back to you. And you're here. Now take me home, won't you? It's supper time and it's been an exciting day. Home. I've never been so ready to go home. The sun begins to set as Daisy and Fred take hands and exit stage right. Lights fade as they walk. Curtains close, end. Yay! <laughs> yes. <laughs> what a Love sweet them. play. So sweet. <laughs> Which was amazing. We loved how imaginative this play were also incorporated mm -hmm. each ingredient in a really creative way. We love the details and all the characters and just really, really so creative. Such a nice character arc, such a nice story. Uh, yeah, that was, that was beautiful. Great job to everyone. Yay! Woo. All right, I am gonna take a moment here for a, uh, a shameless plug. Um, so as you might've seen on our post earlier today, um, we did reach our fundraising goal, which is awesome. And thank you all so much for your wonderful donations, which helps these beautiful artists in these really, really crazy, crazy times. 
Um, however, we also will be accepting donations past our goal. And what those will go to is Philadelphia Young Playwrights Organization, which also is hit very hard by the quarantine. So if you guys want, then you can donate. The money will go to uh, Philadelphia Young Playwrights and it'd be greatly appreciated. The link to donate is in our bio. Um, again, thank you all so much to everyone who donated and everyone else for supporting us. All right, on to our second middle school winner. This is One Faith Apart, Two Souls Behind by Finn Anderson, who's also, I believe, in eighth grade. Yes. Um, all right, so for this one, we are also going to read the characters, give everyone a moment to change their names. Uh, and Brittany, I think that's you. Mm -hmm, thank you. Yeah. All right, awesome. So why don't we start with Anthony Nowak? Anthony Nowak, 17 years old, is a part of a, the Jewish family hiding in Hannah and Zofia's home. He writes in his diary every day just so he has something to do. He sleeps in the attic with his mother and sister. Lena Nowak, 12 years old, suffered a head injury three years ago, and now her vocabulary is only limited to three words. She is the sister of Anthony and is very energetic at times. She speaks through her actions, not her words. Helen Nowak, the mother of Lena and Anthony. She lost her husband, Peter Nowak, three years ago and feels as if she has to fill both roles. Her family originally lived in Warsaw, but now is hiding in the Kroll's house. Sophia Kroll, partner to Hannah and adores Helen's kids to no extent. She acts as if they are her own kids because she longs for her kids in the future. She and Hannah hide in Nowak's, in the, hide the Nowak's in their attic and they only come out when it's dark. But under the mask of admiration, she holds a deep, dark secret about a shoe. Hannah Kroll, partner to Zofia. She wants the best for the Nowak. She will even risk her life to save them. But her dark, deep secret she shares with Zofia overpowers all influences to keep them safe. We also have non-characters that are mentioned throughout the play. We have Zaid, father of Helen, grandfather to Lena and Antony is getting older by the minute and has to stay on bed rest most days. He lives with the Krolls as well, but for how much longer? And Peter Nowak was a father to Antony and Lena, was married to Helen. The entire action of the play takes place in the Krolls' house in Pinsk. Time is the present. One Faith Apart, Two Souls Behind, Act One. Time, nighttime, September 11th, 1943, Holocaust. Place, the lower and upper levels of the Kroll's house in Pinsk, Poland. The house is placed on the outskirts of the city. And then we have a wonderful, wonderful description of the set here, complete with a drawing, which I think is absolutely incredible. This is so re ready, set for production. So kudos to Finn for including this beautiful diagram. Uh, and I hope you can see it here. Make it a little bigger. <laughs> there is the stage diagram, which is absolutely wonderful. Detailed. All right. And now we'll move on to the script. Curtain opens. The scene starts out in the attic on the upper floor. Antony is sitting crisscross applesauce on his mattress on the ground writing in his diary. September 11th, 1943. Dear diary, it has been a few weeks since we moved in with Hannah and Sophia. Mom says they're nice Christians that are helping us hide from the Nazis. Lena, Mom, and I have to sleep in the attic because the Krolls say it's not safe for us to sleep on the lower floors, and that if the Nazis invade in the middle of the night, that we'll have a better chance of not being discovered. We all know what happens if we are. What happened to Dad? But I have hope. And that's all I have. Children! Come down and help your mother set the table. She's going to twist her ankle if she has to carry any more plates. Anthony closes his diary and puts the leather strap around the book and locks it. He stuffs the book under his pillow and runs to the attic hatch, opens it, and throws down the ladder. He's down one step when he looks at the old rusted clock on the wall. The clock reads 2.36. He finishes going down the ladder and hears loud thumps coming down the hallway. He looks down the hall, one hand still on the ladder. Lena is running down the hallway excited. Hey, Lena, how are you? Perschkel neat blocky. <laughs> well, someone seems excited. 
come down, Lena, help your mother. Uh, your mother and Hannah need help in the kitchen. Anthony, you can help me sp uh, spread the tablecloth. Perskul need blocky, perskul need blocky. <laughs> come on, Anthony. Anthony takes both hands and throws the ladder back up, wipes off the dust on his shirt, and starts to walk down the stairs. You know that clock in the attic is broken, right? It's always stuck at 2.36. Yes, I'm well aware. It's been like that for years now. Oh. We always say we're going to fix it, but we never get around to it. If you want, there's a toolbox in the shed out back. How about tomorrow I'll go out and grab it for you, and you can see what you can do. It could be the, you could be the fixer of the house. Sorry, that is a horrible title, but... Yes, yes, that would be awesome. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you were writing in that journal again. You seem to write in it a lot. Anthony reaches the bottom of the stairs and walks center to the dining room table and picks up the other side of the tablecloth Sophia isn't holding. Uh, my dad gave it to me for my 14th birthday. Though that didn't last long. What did it? Him. The night of my birthday was also the night of the siege of Warsaw. We lived there at the time. Lena and I were in bed. And Dad was being the alcoholic he was and going to the bar. My mother was in the living room. You know, we knew it was coming. We just didn't expect it to be so soon. I mean, the Nazis, the explosions, the house started to shake and... We were helpless. That's actually um, <clears throat> how Lena got her head injury. <laughs> Dad didn't come back that night. Helen and Lena walk in through the kitchen door and start to walk to the dining room table. Helen has places, plates in one hand and a pitcher of water in the other. Lena is holding a pile of napkins in one hand, and the other hand holding six glasses and pressing them against her stomach with that hand. Does anyone mind? Uh, yes, here. Taking the pitcher of water from her and putting it on the table, Lena walks over to the table and sets down the napkins and cups. Thank you, my dear. I'm not as strong as I used to be. Two kids will do that to you. <laughs> Lena, will you help Hannah with the turkey in the kitchen? Per school neath blocky, per school neath blocky, per school neath blocky. Runs through the kitchen door excitedly. Well, it seems she seems to be in a good mood today. Anthony, please tell me you didn't give Lena another one of those. No, I didn't give her another one of those. I, well, you know how I feel about those. I know how you feel about those. No need to get defensive about the situation. I am not mean? getting defensive about the situation. Well, you sound pretty defensive to me. Dinner. <sighs> Thank you for that. <laughs> Anytime. <laughs> Zofia puts a hand on Hannah's shoulder and then sits down. Zofia places the turkey on the table and then sits next to Zofia. Shall we? Everyone starts to take food. Hannah starts to serve people slices of turkey. Turkey was pre-cut when Hannah brought it from the kitchen. Wait, has anyone seen Zade? He's taking a nap, dear. You know how he is with his old age. Well, can't we wake him? Perskul me flocky. Anthony. Fine. Did you go into the city today, Sophia? Only for the paper. Unsurprisingly, not many people were out. The papers have instilled fear in them with all their talk of Hitler. Sophia, not at the di dinner table. Not with the children. So, Anthony, I overheard you saying that you were going to fix the broken clock in your room. You didn't tell me that, Aunt. Yeah. Tomorrow, Sophia's going to get the toolbox from the shed for me. She said I could take her with the clock and get it working again. Well, that was very nice of her. <laughs> of course. I love other people doing work for me. <laughs> <laughs> we know. Laughing dies down. Shaking stops. Everyone in shock. What in the... House starts to shake more violently this time. Ah! Everyone under the table now. 
Everyone's, everything starts shaking. Utensils and glass flying everywhere. Helen grabs her two kids and pulls them close to her. Shaking stops. Helen, Hannah runs out from the table under the window to the living room, pulls back the curtain and tries to see if she can see anything. Everyone gets out from under the table as well. Helen is still holding her children. Lena is panting with her eyes wide open. Kids to the attic, now. What? No, I'm not going. We haven't even figured out what- I said go! But, Mom, Don't but... push her, Anthony. Go upstairs, wash up, get changed, then go to bed. That's the end of it. Sophia takes Helen to the kitchen. First school needs Lockie. Anthony gives Hannah a harsh stare, grabs Lena by the arm, and storms upstairs. Jesus. She walks into the kitchen where Zofia is pouring Helen a cup of tea. Helen is sitting at the round and small kitchen table. Zofia is standing. They've gone upstairs. What are we going to do now? What do you mean, what are we going to do now? We're not going to do anything. Puts the tea kettle back on the stove and then walks over to her seat at the table. But what but if what it's if... A... I know. But we can't risk going into town. It's too dangerous. But we need to know if... If it's bombs, if it's if the if the Nazis are here, we can't. We shouldn't. If the it's too much, it's a risk. But we have no choice. I can't have what happened to Peter happen to my children. But that won't happen. You? How do you know? On a slurps tea, back and forth with Zofia and Helen. Zofia and Helen look at her at the same time and look back at each other. It's too dangerous. Don't tell me what is too dangerous. You don't have kids. You don't know what it's like. Stands up for emphasis and accidentally knocks her teacup on the ground. It shatters. I, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to. Hannah gets up to go get a broom and dustpan from the closet next to the kitchen cabinets. So how are we going to do this? What? One of us is going to have to sneak into town. They're going to have to be quick and stealthy. We can't have this house, your family, discovered. I thought you said it was too dangerous. Helen, these are your kids. I'm not going to put their lives in danger, risk or not. Hannah puts the broom and dustpan against the kitchen counter. I'll do it. Zofia and Helen turn around at the same time to Hannah. The hell you will. The hell I will. Is this really happening? Is this really happening? Is this really happening? Anna walks over to Zofia and slaps her on the right cheek. I love you. I love you too. Zofia and Hannah hug each other. Helen grabs the broom and dustpan and starts to sweep up the glass, trying not to pay attention. Hannah looks at the clock on the wall in the kitchen, then walks toward the dining room, to the main door, and grabs coat and shoes. It's 8.30. If I'm not back by quarter to ten, that won't happen. Helen walks in from the kitchen. Hannah finishes putting on her coat and shoes them open. Shoes, shoes, and then opens the door an inch. Gives one look back to Helen and Zofia, then closes the door. All stage lights off. September 11th. 1943. Oh, uh, is this, is this Sophia? It's probably Anthony. Anthony, I think yes. this is Anthony, yes. Okay. September 11th, 1943. Dear diary, I heard all of Mama's conversation. This house isn't that big. It's 1030 and Hannah still isn't home. I can hear Sophia and Mom pacing downstairs. They don't know what happened to her, and now we're all really worried. I'll just have to wait till the morning. Stage lights come back on dimly. Come on, Sophia. It's 2.30. You need sleep. I don't need sleep. I need to see Hannah. She collapses onto the couch with a hand on her head. I'm sorry. I'm just anxious. I'm going to make some tea in the kitchen. Sophia? 
Sophia, it's going to be all right. Helen walks through the kitchen door. Sophia is still on the couch, clock ticking sound in the background as if time is passing faster. How long does it take to steep a kettle of tea? It's almost done. Five seconds later, the ticking stops. Helen walks through the kitchen door to Sophia. Here we go. Helen sets the tray down. A second later, a rumbling starts to shake the house. Helen and Sophia act like they're shaking. The kids. The rumbling grows louder. Helen runs to the stairs. Sophia throws open the door. Hannah? Hannah, Hannah. Anthony, lean up. Where are you? Come down. Hannah, Anthony. Helen and Sophia give each other a wide-eyed look. Then Hannah, Lena. The attic hatch flies open and footsteps start to quickly come down the ladder. Mom! Hershkel needs blocky. They reach the bottom of the stairs into Helen's hug. Rumbling has stopped. Are you both all right? Yeah, we're both okay. We were just scared when the rumbling started again. Me too. Me too. Rumbling ha- starts again, more violently than the time before. The house feels like it's about to fall. It's about to collapse. We have to leave. Okay, uh, go up to the attic and grab whatever you need. Anthony, look out for your sister. No, no, any more time in here. We'll all be dead. Now! All three of them. Everyone runs and grabs their coats. Anthony looks at the clock in the dining room. 2.36. Everyone runs off the stage, out of the house. The spotlight zooms in on the still-lit candle that is shaking and falls into the dining room tablecloth. The fire starts and then everything goes dark. The characters are now all on far stage left looking back at the house. Does anyone else smell? Perskul need flocky. Fire. No. 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 No! Looking back at the house, start walking in circles, pulling on both sides of her hair with one hand on each side and talking to herself. This can't be happening. This can't be happening. This can't be happening! The shoe. What? Shoe? The shoe! The shoe! The shoe! The shoe! I'm going in. Zofia lunges for the door. Helen runs in front of her and puts one hand on each shoulder. What are you doing? It's suicide! I'd rather commit suicide than leave that shoe for hell itself. Sophia! Sophia! <gasps> Anthony and Helen both run over to Lena. Lena is on her knees on the ground. Anthony and Helen both kneel down and Sophia just stares at me. Leaf Blocky! Mershkel Leaf! Mom! Dade! Anthony still leans over Lena. Lena is still crying. Helen marches over to Sophia, who is still staring at the house. Helen puts out her right hand. We do this together, or not at all. Seeming like she's in a trance, Zofia looks over at Helen's outstretched hands and grabs her. Once they hold hands, Zofia nods at her. Antony and Lena now staring at her wide-eyed. Helen mouths the words, I love you. Helen and Zofia, using their free hand, put their coats over their nose and mouths as a mask to prevent smoke from getting in their lungs. Let's go. Holding hands, they run through the front door into the fiery house. No! There is a rustling in the forest, and then Hannah walks out. Hannah sees the scene, looks at Antony, then to the fire, then covers her mouth with her two hands in shock, tears in her eyes. Helen walks out of the house by herself with Zofia's coat in her hands. Tears in her eyes, she looks at Antony, and then Hannah. She drops Zofia's coat and shakes her head horizontally. Curtain closed. September 30th, 1943. Dear Diary, we've almost made it to Sweden. After the bombing, Pinsk was in ruins and the Nazis obtained the city. Pinsk is not our home anymore, but we're just one step closer to freedom. Yesterday, we held a funeral for Sophia and Zaid. 
We collected daisies and tossed them into the stream we found in a peaceful forest. We silently sent out our prayers, and then we were on our way. Oh, yeah, the shoe. <laughs> you must be wondering. Hannah said it wasn't just a shoe. It had the power to, well, I guess I shouldn't say. Hey. Yeah, we, we were amazed with this one. That, yeah, very, very intense, deep, collective deep breath over the internet. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. yeah. The historical world building in play, it was clearly coming from a source of great knowledge, very well researched, very fully realized. Uh, the characters were incredibly fully realized, and I thought there were some really, really amazing relationships in this play that um, really made the reality of the situation come alive even more in a really powerful, moving way. And so bravo to Finn Anderson. Uh, this was really, really fantastic yeah. work. And I hope that you keep developing this play and, uh, and keep writing other plays, mm -hmm. all of you guys. So now we move on to our high school plays and uh, yeah, a bit of a tonal shift. So uh, we, one second, I'm getting some messages. Can everyone, can everyone still hear the sound all right? Some people were talking about the sound. Can you comment? Uh, a thumbs up if you can hear the sound. Oh, not us. <laughs> oh, yeah, we like, can. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> Everyone's still good with the sound on the live stream? Great. <laughs> All right, we're getting some thumbs up. OK. I think the sound might have cut out for a second. <laughs> Rocking and rolling. All right, so moving on to our next play, if I can get this to work. Here, give me one second. There we go. All right. Janie McRae in 10th grade for our first high school play. Uh, this is a wonderful, wonderful piece called What a Life. And this has a bunch of characters. And so in this one, it'll be really useful if you guys can keep track on uh, the screen up here, if you can see that. So you can see who's talking at what point. Um, but yeah, we got, some, we got some wonderful characters, some wonderful acting, some wonderful accents in this one. <laughs> uh, all right. So to go over the characters that you will see, you have Percival the Rabbit, Broderick, I think I'm supposed to say Broderick there, Odessa, Lucinda, Gerald, Natalia, Octavius, Linus, and Maids 1 through 4. <laughs> <laughs> one, scene 1. The lights come up on an elegant ballroom, intricately designed in the style of a 19th century Victorian home. There is a sweeping spiral staircase on one side, leading to a single door and an adjoining structure with two lower level doors and an open center entrance. From stage left, an abnormally large rabbit pops across the stage. Pausing in the center, he sniffs the air, poops, and continues on <laughs> to stage right. Four maids enter and begin decorating the ballroom with tasteful decorations. A man's frustrated scream can be heard off stage. Ah! Percival, you blasted buck, I swear, as soon as I get my hands on you. Roderick turns in from stage left, abruptly stopping as soon as he sees the maids. They give him a wary glance, giggling and whispering <laughs> in their work. Roderick nods in their direction, changing his pace to an overly refined strut. Uh, is all in readiness for tonight? <laughs> yes, sir. We've hung the wreaths and such, sir. The ballroom floor has been waxed, sir, and the feast is underway in the kitchen, sir. <laughs> yes, yes. Very good, very good. And the curtains, they've been cleaned, yes? Yes, sir. The curtains have been cleaned, sir. <laughs> mm-hmm. I see. Yes. Quite nice. Clean. Yes. Well, get back to it now, don't you? You don't have all day. The guests will be arriving soon. The maids scramble to collect their items and scurry off stage. Broderick takes a moment to observe the scene before running stage right. In his hurry, his foot lands in the pile of poop left by the abnormally large rabbit. Ah, <laughs> uh, goddamn it, Percival! Roderick rips off the kid's shoe, throwing it off stage and runs after it. As he exits, the door at the top of the staircase opens, and a woman in a shimmery gold evening dress steps out. Roderick! Roderick, come here! I need you! Odessa pauses before screaming Broderick's name. <laughs> Re-enters slowly and reluctantly. 
Yes, Odessa, my lovely dear angel. This dress make my arms look fat. No, no, of course not, sugar plum candy apple. You look <laughs> dazzling. Well, that new telephone we bought is just as as mu- is, is just so much heavier than the last one, and I think my arms may be getting bigger from lifting it up so often. And I just couldn't bear it if the ladies from the club tonight thought I was putting on weight. I mean, can you imagine? The awful things they would say. I remember when Natalia had a child at one time and we and put on a few pounds. The ladies never let her hear the end of it. How awful. Darling, you needn't worry. You look simply flawless. <laughs> Ravishing as always, but I really must go. I have urgent, urgent business to attend to before the guests arrive. Roderick is interrupted by the ring of the doorbell. Ding dong. I'm not ready. Roddy, go entertain them, will you? And what in God's name happened to your other shoe? Odessa stands to the room at the top of the stairwell, and a maid opens the center door. A young couple enters, the woman wearing a flamboyant magenta dress and feather headpiece, and the man in a simple black suit. Well, hello, Broderick. Nice to see you. Broderick, I'm afraid we're a bit early. We always overestimate how long your driveway is. How ridiculous of us. Ours is over two miles, of course. It really gives guests time to marvel at our gardens and such. (laughs) But of course, yours is nice as well. Uh, Lucinda, Gerald, how lovely to see you both. Wow, I simply adore how you decorated. So sweet and quaint. And such an interesting scent in the air, too. Is Odessa trying out a new incense? Percival hops on stage from stage left behind Lucinda and Gerald in the eyeline of Broderick. Seeing Percival, Broderick's eyes widen and he gestures to Gerald to turn around. Gerald begins to panic and frantically motion at Broderick. <coughs> Get him out! What was that, dear? Um, nothing. Just a little bit of phlegm stuck in my throat. <laughs> he continues making a hissing noise. Broderick <coughs> in his breath and cough. Oh, goodness! Are you all right? Let me call for a maid to bring you some water. Lucinda begins to turn around to call for a maid, but Gerald grabs her shoulders and steers her towards the stairwell. Odessa certainly has some water upstairs. Isn't that right, Broderick? <coughs> yes. <coughs> yes, of course. <coughs> well, it wouldn't be much quicker, quicker if you were to grab some water from upstairs and bring it down for old Broderick here. Gerald, what a juvenile suggestion. It would be most inappropriate for me to go upstairs in a home that isn't my own. <coughs> <coughs> Make haste, woman, before he hacks up a lung. (laughs) Lucinda rushes upstairs and into the room at the top of the stairwell. As soon as she is behind the door, Broderick and Gerald run towards the rabbit, Broderick using his other shoe to chase it, then grabbing it and wrestling it into his arms. Good Lord, Broderick, how did he get out of the room? Gerald, I have great fear for Percival has begun to act out. All week he's been escaping his cage, destroying our furniture, making a royal mess of his food. Just this morning, he pooped in the middle of the ballroom. Oh, dear. Oh, dear. Oh, dear. This is not good news, Broderick. Oh, Gerald, I know. I'm afraid his actions begin to influence the others. The last thing we need is a rebellion on our hands. Lucinda emerges from behind the door, carrying a pitcher of water and a glass. Go! Go! I've grabbed some water, Broderick. Now you mustn't drink it too fast or you'll only choke some more. Where has he gone? Uh, He left to go find his own glass of water with, you know, you taking two million years up there. He's left? Why? How rude after I went to all that trouble to get him a glass of water. Did he seem a little odd to you? What, Broderick? Yes. He was acting quite funny, if you ask me. Did you notice he only was wearing one shoe? Uh, (laughs) Ah, that's just his old funny self. Quite the character he is, old Broderick. Yes, but the shoe. 
How incredibly improper of him to be only wearing one shoe, especially with guests in the house. <laughs> Can you imagine why? Oh, yes, yes. He did mention to me while you were upstairs that he was wearing only one shoe because he was uh, getting his foot resized. Yes, oh. that's it. He is getting his foot resized. You see, one of his feet is just a bit larger than the other one. <laughs> He's quite embarrassed of it, actually. He was having his foot measured when we arrived. But you told me he left the room to grab, grab a glass of water. Uh, this was before, of course. He took the time to mention all of this in the midst of his coughing fit. Well, he was naturally quite ashamed of his rugged appearance. Hmm. Even so, he was still acting quite odd. Something here is off. I can feel it. Not to mention it smells absolutely rank in this room. Okay, great. Uh, I'm going to need to hold for one second. I need to uh, reboot this live stream because we have a time limit, so I'm going to go bring it back up. But everyone, come right back. We'll be back in a minute. Okay. One second, everybody. We love a farce. Mm. <laughs> we do. <laughs> we absolutely do. <laughs> Octavius is going to have glasses. And we're back. Let's give everyone a second to come back on. One second. All right. We got some join people joining. Trickling back in. Thumbs up. Thumbs up. Yes. Oh, not us. Oh, right. <laughs> yeah. Well, thumbs up that you're here. <laughs> All right, almost. Just gonna see if we get back to the same number we were at before. Make sure no one misses it. Hello, everyone. Welcome back. All right, and go. Let's continue. I'll. I'll well, that's me. Actually, I'm reading. All right. The doorbell rings again, and a maid opens the center door. Another couple walks in, this pairing slightly older and more refined. They are pushing a golden gilded stroller with a toddler-aged child inside. The woman is wearing a simple, modest blue dress, and the man is wearing a pinstripe gray suit and a pair of spectacles. Oh. Natalia. Lucinda. Octavius. Gerald. Natalia. Gerald, Octavius, Lucinda. There is an awkward pause as the two couples look around the room. How lovely <laughs> to see you both. Oh, I see you brought your little one. <laughs> yes, we thought young Linus should have some cultivation before preschool. Oh, well, let me be the first to say, you look just great, Natalia. You're glowing, really. Almost as if you were still pregnant. Odessa <laughs> <laughs> suddenly emerges from the door at the top of the stairwell. Ah, welcome, guest. I am excited beyond words to welcome you all into my humble abode. Please, make yourselves at home. Odessa begins her dramatic descent down the staircase as the guests watch uncomfortably. She's interrupted by Broderick's entrance from stage left. How wonderful. Natalia, Octavius, you two have made it. No, we wouldn't miss your parties for the world. We brought you a gift. You've brought a gift? Yes, it's a beautiful sculpture crafted by the hands of one of the most talented artists of her time, Philanthropos Nightlean. He definitely has the sculpture to Broderick. How lovely. It's a baby. This is no ordinary baby. No, this is youthful child. The centerpiece in Nightlean's mass collection is truly a one-of-a-kind creation. Oh, certainly. We will treasure it and have no doubt. Okay. Odessa, still stopped on the stairs, rushes down to greet everyone. How 
entirely cr incredible to see everyone. Ladies, ladies, you both look ravishing, really. And gentlemen, quite handsome, of course. Broderick, dear, why are you not wearing any shoes? Lucinda gives Gerald a look and cranes her neck to hear his answer. Well, I, uh, you see, I was mugged. They were stolen off my feet while I was uh, fetching a glass of water. How awful, I know. Oh dear God, you were mugged inside our house? Oh. oh heavens! We must call the police. They could still be inside. No, 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 no. No need to call the police. It wasn't inside. It was down the road a little bit, outside oh. the bell tower. You went all the way to the bell tower with your glass of water? However, did you get back so quick? It's almost a mile away. I ran, of course. Good for the lungs after you've had a cough. I read it in Sports Magazine just the other week. Isn't that right, Gerald? That Sports Magazine we were reading together? Uh, yes, I remember that very clearly. The point is that I'm fine now. More than fine, really. I'm sure that man needed my shoes a lot more than I did. Oh. Suddenly, Linus begins to cry. <laughs> you dumb rat! You dumb rat! Ugh. Linus, sweetheart, shh. Oh, don't mind him. He learned his first few words recently. <laughs> you dumb rat! How pleasant. I wonder how he picked that up. Pet name you call each other, is it? <laughs> <sighs> well, I never. How about some drinks, yes? I'll just go to the kitchen, grab some champagne. Hmm. Lucinda, do you care to join me? Oh, sure. I'd love to help, dear. Hmm. Lucinda and Odessa exit through the door situated stage left. I think I'll just leave Linus here, if that's all right, and give him a bit of a rest. She wheels the stroller against the wall in between the table where Broderick placed the mask and a large grandfather clock. That is quite a lovely clock, Broderick. Thank you. Uh, it was my father's, actually, from his summer home. Such intricate detail. Oh, but such a shame the time is all wrong. 2.36. <laughs> it stopped moving about a week ago. Couldn't explain it if you asked me. I had to take it to the clock worker to see if he could fix it. There is a scream from the... Ah! Oh dear heavens! My lovely angel, what in God's name has happened to you? There was a, a creature, a huge, foul rat, bigger than any normal sized rodent. It was the size of a dog. Oh, Broderick, my love, please, please kill it! Do away with the beast! Oh, the sight of it will never leave my eyes. Oh, it was horrible! Octavia rushes into the kitchen to investigate and comes out again, wielding a rolling pin. Ladies, there is nothing in there, I promise you. It must have been a hallucination or a trick of the light, perhaps. This was no trick of the light. This was a rabid beast. Percival appears in the center entrance, but goes unnoticed by all except Roderick. Uh, Gerald... Why don't you grab that pitcher of water from the table? And uh, Octavius, Natalia, help me lead these ladies to the sofa. You, most, you both uh, must rest after such a scare. Yeah. Broderick quickly leads Odessa to the seating area and hurriedly pushes her onto the sofa. Here, Gerald, let me help you. Broderick runs over to Gerald, who has picked up Percival and is frantically looking for somewhere to hide him. They animatedly yet silently fight while Natalia and Octavius tend to Odessa and Lucinda. Broderick suddenly lifts a sleeping Linus out of his stroller and hides the baby in the grandfather clock. <laughs> he grabs Percival out of Gerald's arms and hides the rabbit in the stroller, in a moment of genius, placing the youthful child mask over the rabbit's face. Gerald angrily gestures at him, but before their actions can be undone, Broderick grabs the pitcher of water and returns to the seating area. Ah, here you go, Odessa, Lucinda. I can't imagine how you must be feeling right now. How awful to have such a horrific hallucination. Oh, Brody, this was no hallucination, I swear to you. I saw this creature with my own two eyes. Yes, this was real. It had to be. I could smell its awful stench, and I looked into its 
beady little eyes and saw hatred and cruelty. Oh, how awful, how awful it was! How awful indeed. Who was that? You poor souls, you. Where could that be coming from? <laughs> How sad a society that allows poor women such as yourselves to suffer in such a way. My God, it's coming from over there. The group cautiously approaches the back of the room and the stroller, still unsure where the voice is coming from. Yes, a society in which such terrifying creatures look in every corner, cowering on four legs like the weakest of the world. Oh, heavens, is it Linus? My brilliant boy, I knew such cultivation would do him good. <laughs> if only the world could be gone with all the wretched four-legged creatures, the crawlers, the hobblers, the furry back beasts. What is he saying? What nonsense is this? <laughs> if only animal and man could see eye to eye! If only we could talk and walk and exist as equals! If only we could poop! where we choose and frolic freely in the meadows and fields. Ah, <sighs> what a life. 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 What is this? What is happening? What a life. What a life. This is ridiculous. What kind of trick are you playing on us? The chanting becomes unbearably loud when suddenly massive explosion. The grandfather, right. 236, explodes with ducks and geese. The doors burst open to reveal hordes of abnormally large animals walking on two legs. <laughs> a chant of what a life. The women begin to scream. <laughs> Ew, dumb rats! To be heard in the spot. <laughs> A smash occurs as the mask on Percival's face falls to the ground. There are a few moments of pure chaos before the lights go out. And there's silence. Scene two. <laughs> the lights come up on the couple sitting uncomfortably in the seating area, joined by a few animals seated in a human-like fashion. There is an awkward silence for a few moments, interrupted only by the animals making vaguely animal-like noises. Does someone care to explain what the hell just happened? <sighs> Roderick and Gerald look back and forth at each other until both men stand. Uh, yeah, that would be us. Gerald? You were involved in this, this act of terror? Yes. Yes, I was. That is true. Uh, so you see, we had an idea one night while we were having a few drinks. It was a bit of a ridiculous idea, very ridiculous, I would say, but we weren't in the right mindset to think logical thoughts. Uh, so naturally, illogical thoughts were at the tip of our brains in our slightly altered states. Uh, we decided to invest a good bit in the exotic animal industry. Uh, to be more specific, the abnormally large farm animal industry. Yeah, so we purchased a few of these abnormally large animals, but they were slightly larger than we were expecting. Significantly larger, actually. But there was no returning them, of course. So <laughs> we kept them in my office. You kept these things in our house without my knowledge? How blasphemous of you, Broderick! But you see, we had a brilliant plan for them. We were going to teach them things, little tidbits and tricks, put on a show, earn some solid cash, then sell them to the highest bidder. <laughs> but things got a little bit out of hand. Yes, seeing as they are abnormally large animals, they have abnormally large brains as well. Some would even say they have brains as large as human brains. Yes, some would say. So they learned things that we taught them very quickly, which was good, we thought. We could get them off our hands that much quicker. But then they started learning things that we didn't teach them. Uh, Percival here, uh, he learned how to open doors, pick locks and such. Yes, I am very nifty that way. Ooh. And they develop dreams and aspirations and such. I want to be a professor of literature one day. Ah, uh, yes. <laughs> 
and they kept trying to escape. Brilliant story. And now aren't we here now and now we are here, aren't we, boys? Well, what do we do with them? Now, that's the question we've been mulling over for some time now. I would have to say that we really have no idea. This is absolutely outrageous. How could you lie to me like this, Gerald? I cannot fathom simply how you can lie to me in such the a terrible- The doorbell terrible... rings, and one of the maids answers it, opening the door to reveal Philanthropius Nightling. Hello. Oh my goodness. Philanthropius Nightling. I adore your work. I really do. I oh, feel okay, okay. I'm here because one of my artworks was smashed inside of the room. I cannot feel it for miles away. There was a sharp pain in my chest. I could not breathe for several moments. My mind went blank. Bright white light filled my eyes, and I saw this home with its peculiarly short driveway. I ran here in bare feet to find my darling masterpiece and mourn her loss. Mr. Knightling, we are deeply sorry. There was an incident and nothing of incidents i will only talk of repayment we refuse to repay you that is ludicrous what is ludicrous is that you would have the nerve to smash one of my masterpieces mr knightley how would you feel about repayment in the form of a miracle of nature a masterpiece of dna of science Yes, uh, how would you like our very own collection of animal anomalies? Talking, walking, abnormally sized animals. I would consider it. Well, please, if you're interested, take the whole lot of them. They're all for you, all for you. <laughs> what an interesting thought. I could sculpt them. Brilliant, they're yours. Well, I must bid a teary goodbye. Our time with you was good, though you will never comprehend the genius of our being. I wish you all good health as I pursue my dreams and you continue living. Oh. Au revoir, mes amis. Au revoir. Lights down, end of play. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Oh. You know, uh, so much fun. We personally really, really loved our wonderful farce class <laughs> dynamics. Very Oscar Wilde, very what James. Like. Delightful, delightful character building. And then I love how it just blows up in a truly unexpected way. I remember I read this this play and I just ended with like my mouth on the floor. I was like, how did that happen? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that that was so so wonderful. Thank you so much, Janie yeah. McRae, for the wonderful submission. Absolutely, keep writing. This is so great. I love <laughs> love, love your ability to create these delightful characters that really just jump off the page. Um, Literally, right. <laughs> we so are much fun. To our final play. <sighs> Very sad, but this is a true treat. We have Nicholas Pierron, twelfth grader, who wrote Yeezy Phone Home. <laughs> <laughs> this play is also truly, truly wonderful. All right, um, so uh, anyone who don't know, Yeezy is Kanye West's uh, nickname of sorts. That's, that's, I think, the only context you need to this, and then it'll kind of become a little <laughs> go crazy. All right, so in this play, we have John, a burnt-out investment analyst at the bank, the voice of reason. We have Rob. Oh, wow, we have costumes now. Look at this. Yes, yes. yes. Why yeah. not? Get the hat. Quick shout out to Eric for having scenes with him in that last play because that was really. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. So we have Rob, who is one of the bank's security guards, bad with money. We have Kel, an employee at an Adidas store, aggressive. And we have Alien, an alien stranded from their home front. <laughs> All right. The setting is a bank in a random town. On stage right is John's desk. Closer to center stage is Rob's security outlet. There are different monitors set up. Finally, a comically large vault door is conveniently placed towards stage left, next to John and Rob's workspaces. 
Rob enters from stage right. Hey, John. Oh, hey, Rob. Why are you here so early? Early? It's my usual shift on Mondays. I mean, I would have been here sooner, but traffic was backed up because of some crash. I think it had to do with the convention going on. John points at the clock on the wall. The time says 2.36. But it's only 2.36. <sighs> Feels like it's been 2.36 for hours. Eh, John. It's 6.53. 6.53? It can't be. He gets up from his chair to look at Rob's watch. Then he surveys the bank, closer to stage right. Did everybody else? Ugh, it's dark out. He walks towards his desk. Well, that's two hours wasted. Someone's got to fix that clock. Why didn't Corey tell you it was closing time when his shift ended? Corey doesn't talk to me. Corey doesn't like talking to me. Now, why would Corey not like talking to you? John shrugs. Pause. Rob starts to browse the internet while John begins walking off stage right. Say, John, you're an investment analyst. Before you go, could you give me some advice? Sure. With what? So I was looking into the stock market, you know, heard you can make some big bucks in it. So I bought some. Look at you, big time investor. Uh, <laughs> what did you buy? A hundred dollars worth of shares in GameStop. GameStop? I was afraid you were gonna say that. <laughs> what compelled you to invest in a dying company like GameStop? It, it, it's not dying. My daughter loves GameStop. Me and Chuck take her to get a new DS game every time she gets straight A's on her report card. Then your kid is the anomaly. All the kids I know these days either stay at home on their phone or just buy their games digitally. They're gremlins. There's nothing that will ever save GameStop. They sell shirts. Everyone wears shirts. Shirts won't save the company. Isn't a share like five bucks? <laughs> Look it up on your... What are you looking at? Oh, uh, this? I'm just shopping for- Yeezys? Seriously? Hey, Yeezys are great. I'm wearing a pair right now. He puts up his foot, revealing his fresh Yeezy. Boom, the Adidas Yeezy Boost 350 V2 Black. Cop this baby for $220 before I got here. And I thought GameStop was your worst investment. <laughs> Please, they're comfy, they're stylish, they're made by Kanye West, an artist. You listen to Kanye? Sure do, he's the key. The key? What? Name a song he does. The one about the pooper scooper? <laughs> you sound just like Chuck. Just criticizing my choices. No wonder Corey doesn't like talking to you. Boom! An explosion goes off. Dust and debris fall from the ceiling. What's going on? A rope falls down, hanging from the ceiling. And did we lose Ange? It would appear we lost Ange in our live stream. All right, well. I can, I can read for Cal until they come back. All right, boom, an exp oh wait, wait, Cal, <gasps> there they are. Hi, yes, hey. hi. No problem, welcome it's back. It's your big entrance. <laughs> yeah, all right. You came in, you crashed the ceiling. A rope falls down, hanging from the ceiling. Kel enters, sliding down and landing in the middle of the bank. She's wearing all black, a hoodie and sweatpants with an alien mask. She points a technologically advanced laser gun at John and Rob. Where is it? Oh, you must be one of those passionate sci-fi fans here for the convention. It's about four blocks to our right. Take care now. I don't think that's what she wants to find. Exactly. Where is the money? Oh, this is a robbery. Duh. So can we make things simpler or are we going to have to do this the hard way? 
Cal gestures with her laser gun. Please don't hurt us. I may not have the best family. You know, my brother is a convict too. Stole a whole rack of glue from CBS, but I still. From the ceiling, Alien falls into center stage, screaming. Ah! Big head, big eyes, and a green grayish skin tone. They also have a technologically advanced laser gun. Home? No, it ain't home, dude. Stay up there. You sure they ain't going to the con? That mask is lifelike. Kel! Shh. Kel! 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 I'm working on it! I just gotta figure out how to get the ball open! Is that... Is that an alien? It can't be. No. Nah. No. Aliens don't exist. <laughs> Forget the alien part. Did they just say Kel? He approaches Kel, head tilted. What? No, nah, they didn't say Kel. I have no clue what you're talking about. Back up, or I'll fire. This is some advanced alien weaponry. You don't want to mess with. Rob pulls the mask off Kel. Me. Kel! Ah! I thought that was you. How you doing? Wait, you know her? Of course I do. It's Kel from the Adidas sort. She sold me my Yeezys. Elian's head picks up. Yeezys? They see Rob's Yeezys. Yeezys! You're insane if you think you're taking my Yeezys! Why would an alien and an Adidas employee work together to rob a bank? Or maybe steal someone's Yeezys? Home. Their spaceships crashed. I happened to be there when I was leaving work. Poor buddy couldn't even get out of the craft without my help. They don't speak much English, but I think they're gonna try to, they're trying to get somewhere. Home! So you, you need the money to fix the ship. Exactly. Well, you know, pocketing some for myself. Won't have to smell footwear ever again. Can't you use something like space bucks or whatever aliens use? Cal, Yeezys. Pretty sure they don't have space bucks. Cold hard cash, maybe. Maybe some Yeezys. Yeezys! They won't shut up about them. Must have caught a good scent from those, so let's make this simple. Hand over the key to that conveniently placed comically large vault. Yeezys! And the Yeezys. Or else what? Alien and Cal point their laser guns at John and Rob. A hum begins to emit from the weapons. There must be some peaceful way we can solve this. Relax, John. <laughs> Those are just toys. How do you know? Come on, I've done security for years. I know when a fake is a fake. Alien raises their laser gun in the air. A flash of blue brightens the bank for a second. John and Rob yelp. <gasps> okay. Maybe it's not a fake. Uh, may I talk to my friend for a moment? <sighs> Make it quick. Kill! It's fine. If they take too long. Her laser gun hums. <sighs> Cal and Alien laugh. John and Rob creep off. <laughs> <laughs> you have to give them your Yeezys. What? No, for my dead body. What's so important about those shoes anyways? Comfy, stylish, Kanye. If that alien is so hung about your Yeezys, maybe they won't even care that the money's in the vault. They could rob, like, a Denny's instead. Or a GameStop. Not a chance. What about Kel? The only person satisfied from stealing a pair of Yeezys is the one who gets to keep the Yeezys. We'll cross that bridge if need be. Just give them the Yeezys. No. Give them the Yeezys, Rob. No! Rob, for the love of... I am not paid enough to deal with difficult co-workers like you, okay? I am tired of your antics. If you're not paid enough, then why don't you just rob the place with them? Maybe I will. There's enough in there to like triple my salary for many years. Uh, wait. Are you actually... All right. We would like to propose a deal. Go on. The alien wants to go home. You hate your job. I hate my job. He hates his job. I love my job. I think we could all use some of that money. 
So how about this? In return for not ratting you and your friend out, we get a share of that cash. <laughs> and what's stopping us from just blasting you two right now and taking all the money for ourselves? You don't get the key. We'll find it ourselves. Yeezys. And just take the Yeezys from your buddy. There's security cameras. We can delete the footage. You need a passcode. We'll find it. Rob is the only one that knows it. Actually, Corey knows it. <laughs> Fine, but we get 80% of the cash. Yeezys! And the Yeezys! Deal? I'm not giving up my Yeezys! Rob, you're I'm not, giving up those they Yeezys. They are mine. Like it or I paid two hundred and twenty dollars for these. You and once I make money from my GameStop stock, I'll buy a game stock my daughter shares. matching ones, and we'll be one this happy is what you easy get. You family. Alien blasts a laser in the air. Flash of blue. Yeezys. Pause. Rob looks at Alien, then at his Yeezys, then at Alien, then at his Yeezys. He sighs and begins to slowly take them off. Rob sniffles and hands Alien his shoes. The last time he will ever hold his cherished Yeezys. Oh, here. Yeezys. Alien begins to jump for joy so much that a key falls out of one of his shoes. Kel picks up the key. Is this the key to the... Yeah, that's it. Is that huh. why you were so attached to those things? To keep the key safe? What? Of course, John. Because I desperately didn't want them to. No, I've always had the key in my shoe. You just can't accept my love for Yeezys. I really can't. Just open the thing. They all approach the vault. Kel places the key in the vault door. Beat. Then the door begins to slide open. Shall we? John, Rob, and Kel begin to exit stage left into the vault, but stop when they notice aliens still in place. Hugging the Yeezys. Rob, are you coming? Yeezys. All right. We'll leave you two alone for a bit. Boo, so long, Adidas. I don't have to work another job in retail ever again. <laughs> You've worked multiple retail jobs? Unfortunately. Question. Which job was the worst? Oh, definitely GameStop. I rest my case. Just shut up. They exit. Lights dim. Spotlight on Alien. Their inner thoughts now evoked. At last, my Yeezys. My precious pair of Adidas Yeezys boost 350 V2 <laughs> black. The galaxy's endless abyss separated me from you for far too long. Eons. And all it took was three foolish humans to get the job done. Anyone would fall for greed and a helpless alien who knows little to no English. Who, know, who knew I only needed to know home, Kel, and Yeezy to get exactly <laughs> what I wanted? English, too, at Space College did not fail me now. But enough about them. All that matters now is that I'm home. The Yeezys begin to glow. <gasps> Yeezy. Is that you? <laughs> Contacted me so soon. Well, don't worry. I'll be there momentarily. I'd be happy to know I retrieved the spacecraft as you asked. Perhaps brought back slightly more damage than I hoped. However, it's fixable. And once we get the funds to fix it, I'll fly it straight towards your island. There, we can plan our next course of action. Kanye West's Lift Yourself begins to play, specifically the poop scoop part. <laughs> As Alien maniacally laughs louder and louder. <laughs> <laughs> then, blackout. End of play. <laughs> yes. Ridiculous. We loved it so much. I loved it. <laughs> it. We also really thought that this play represented the spirit of the competition beautifully in the way it incorporated every single, uh, every single ingredient, not only as a feature of the story, but as a part of the story, as a, a part of the plot, which was really, really wonderful. Loved it so much. 
So yes, <laughs> congratulations to all of our wonderful playwrights. Thank you to everyone yes. who submitted. Mm -hmm. Thank you to everyone who submitted. Thank you so much to our beautiful actors. Huge virtual round of applause to all of you guys. Yeah. <laughs> I hope that you will please uh, continue to look at our, our GoFundMe, donate to PYP, and uh, thank you so much for all listening. I'm gonna end the live stream now. Bye, everybody. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> Right. And we're off. Wow. <laughs> yeah, it was so much fun. And by the way, between those uh, those two live streams, we had a total of 116 viewers. Wow. wow. That's so good. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. And wow. Once, we peaked at uh, at 59 at one at one point. Which is cool. That's yeah. great. Cool. So, thank you all so much. You were amazing. Um, thank you. Oh, and look at that. We ended right on time. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so Brittany, I'll just be in touch with you about how to transfer the GoFundMe funds to uh, PYP. Um, and uh, yeah, I hope you all have great quarantines. Uh, if you want to <laughs> just uh, any other ideas or things in the chat, I'm here. You have my email. Uh, and yeah, thank you all. Thank, thank you, you for organizing. This is great. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Bye, everybody. Bye, Brian. Bye. Bye. Bye.